Hello, hello. Welcome back to The Wicked Ones. Hope everyone had a great spring break. This is Tara. And this is Jen. So what's going on? Welcome back. Thank you. I saw that you wore green and you looked amazing. Aw, thanks. You know, it was crazy how it all worked out because I tried to shop forever for a dress and I just didn't find anything. And then $30 and a last minute two day Hail Mary to Amazon and it worked out great. No, you looked gorgeous. And yeah, I saw thanks. sun. I'm it was like 80 degrees every day. Yeah, this would look beautiful. Yeah, it was great. It was a beautiful wedding. So beautiful. And I will tell you, every single person that we met down there was amazing. Like the people were just so fantastic. All of their friends and family. Just the nicest, generous, most kind people. It was just it was great to be around them. Good. I'm glad yeah. you guys had a great trip. We did. We did. And today, I'm going to tell you a tale that has no murder. Oh, okay, yes, we did agree um, to that. I agreed, yes. After all of the heinous crimes I've talked about, I decided that I was going to take something um, just a little less nightmarish, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Today, I'm going to tell you the scandalous tale of Marcus Schrenker. Does that Ooh, ring a bell? It does not. Oh, good. No, the name doesn't. So good. I well, at the ripe old age of 38, Schrenker had landed himself in some hot water and decided he was going to escape, let's say, right? So in January of 2009, he faked his own death and led law enforcement on a three-day manhunt. Ooh. Do you remember this at all? Okay, so it's, it's a little bit... 2009, I, so yeah. it's, it's a, it's a ways uh-huh, back. A while ago. I remember looking into some of these stories because I was curious. Because I was curious, I just remember thinking before when I was listening to some of these podcasts before we started our own podcast and mm-hmm. thinking, I wonder how many of these people that are missing were missing on purpose. It's like, is there anybody out there that did this because they just wanted to get away? And I was trying to find stories. So I probably came across this one, but I just don't remember. He wasn't successful. Ah. Obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be talking yeah. about it. But he tried really hard. <laughs> so what's his story? Uh well and the story is kind of twofold. Um I'm going to tell you, you know, a little bit about how he tried to fake his own death. Mm-hmm. But obviously, there's a reason why. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that's kind of you, wondering. I'm like, what is yeah. so bad that you need to get out? Get out. Mm-hmm. Escape. Yeah. So I'm going to start at the beginning. He, uh, Marcus Shrinker, he grew up in Maryville, Indiana. Ah, Indiana. Indiana. <laughs> Fellow Hoosier. <laughs> <laughs> and he attended uh, Purdue University, where he met his wife, Michelle. After college, he became a financial advisor and business owner, and he lived a very lavish lifestyle with his Mm. wife and his three children. They resided in a million-dollar home, waterfront, approximately 10,000 square feet, in Geist, Indiana. It sounds terrible so far. (laughs) (laughs) You definitely want to escape that, right? Are you familiar with that area? Apparently, it's like an it area, like an it suburb of Indianapolis. Okay, so I am not familiar with that. I am familiar with Purdue, so it's like right next to where I grew up, and probably half my graduating class went to either Purdue, IU, or Ball State. Mm -hmm. So very familiar with that area, but I'm not familiar with Geist, and we actually are heading down for a tournament in Indianapolis coming up, and I I want to go see if it's close by. Yeah, see if you see some signs or something. It's supposed to be really nice. Obviously, nowhere I could live, but that's okay. Uh, the family had it all, right? They, they had uh, the expensive luxury cars, the high-end clothing, the exotic vacations. Schrenker was into aviation, so they even had planes. Oh, wow. The family wanted for nothing. This family was living a good life. It sounds like it. But at the expense of others. Mm. As owner of not one, but three companies, Schrenker deceived his investors for personal financial gain. Yeah. I know. He used his love of planes and flying to target pilots. He befriended his clients, meeting their family, making them comfortable. He was a real schmoozer. You know the type? Uh, And it worked. I do. I do. He claimed to make low-risk investments and told his clients, the only money I make, the only 
I only make money if you, if you make, make money. money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that one. I and know. earning only 1% of management fee. Sure, yeah. But instead of investing in mutual funds and charging no commissions as promised, he actually put his clients' money into one annuity after the next. So this earned him huge commissions. Mm -hmm. But every time the money bounced around, it cost his clients hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they didn't know. He will, of course, deny all of these things and claim that the fall of the market is to blame for his clients' losses, Mm -hmm. among other excuses. Mm -hmm. You will learn in this story that Shrinker is nothing but a liar. Sounds like it. Yeah. So things began to heat up in 2006 for him and even more in 2007 when the market started to decline. Oh, So when he blames the market a little bit, it did have an effect on what was happening. But because clients started questioning him more and more and they wanted to move their money to safer investments, Mm -hmm. the the market was starting to decline. And then he didn't have their money? To he give back to did them? not have their money. So he was able to dodge things for a little bit, kind so, of ride it out. Do you remember when Bernie made off? When yes. the whole thing yes. when was that though? That was was like, that was before this. I think it was before this. So it just it just it baffles me that these things can still happen so Oh, I'm sure it's still easily. Happening. Oh, I'm sure. But yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? You just think after that whole thing, people would be like just a little more careful. It's, so he really played, and I didn't go into this in, in my story, but he really played, like, when Delta, there was this thing that went on with Delta Airlines, and they were retiring a bunch of pilots. Something was happening with, like, their retirement fund, and he, I mean, he, he was just smoother. He went in there and was mm-hmm. like, I'm going to take care of you guys. I'm a fellow pilot. Yeah. I'm going to take your guys' money, and then we're going to do this, this, and this, because I care about you. It, it, it was a very yeah. okay okay I can see how it could happen I it was just, very opportunistic I just I feel like I guess at some point if you want to invest and you want to try to do more with your money you're gonna have to trust somebody at some point but from what I understand this is me and this is my I don't trust anyone because you know me mm-hmm. oh yeah <laughs> you shouldn't have to solicit me for investments no. like if you're doing well you're busy yeah. You shouldn't have to. No, that makes sense. Right? That makes sense. That would be a red flag for me. Steve would be like, yeah, he's a good guy. That's probably a good key We're going to have him over for dinner. Yeah, for everyone. Oh, totally. He'd be like, one of the bros. Yeah. <laughs> Billy bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. But by January of 2008, his misdoings finally caught up with him. Shranker and his family were still living their good life when the Indiana Department of Insurance files a complaint against him. This complaint is on behalf of seven of his investors, and they claim that he cost them more than $250,000. They say that he never informed them that they would have to deal with the high fees to switch annuities. That's not what they agreed to. Mm -hmm. His clients also claimed that he manipulated them and became friendly with their family to betray them. Mm -hmm. Which Which is exactly what he did. Which we know is true because I already told you that. Yeah. Schrenker also had some trouble on the home front. So did his wife, though? We can talk about that. Oh, (laughs) okay. He had been having an affair with a woman at the airport where he kept his plane. And finally, on December 30th of 2008, his wife, Michelle, files for a divorce. She had enough. Yeah. I think she sensed the downward spiral, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, time to get out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, all right. We throw this one out. Uh, So things are going to pick up pace here, so stay with me. Things happen really, really fast after this. Okay. On December 31st, 2008, Shrinker's Indiana State Financial Advisor license expires. Okay. Kind of weird. He let that lapse. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Law enforcement then obtains a warrant to search his home and three companies. Computers, photos, Anything related to the accusations that were made against him. Yeah, you can't get rid of that much stuff that fast. <laughs> Not a good sign. <laughs> no. On January 9th, 2009, a federal judge in Maryland issues a $533,000 judgment against Shrinker's company, Heritage Wealth Management Incorporated. It's mm. a lot of money. It is. 
Then, besides that, on behalf of another company, OM Financial Life Insurance Company, they say, the judge says, that HWM, Heritage Wealth Management, must return more than $230,000 in commissions. Ah, okay. He's found out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hell of a lot of money to come up with. It is. So as you can see, he's in a little bit of a situation. Mm -hmm. Financially, personally, like his wife might have been able to overlook the affair if things were... Oh, we see that all the time. Okay, otherwise, but... Fine, but you are buying me this, 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 and this, right? Yes, yes. I mean, I can't see it because I'd be like, I'm out. Yeah. I'm, and I'm you'd scared. be out. Yeah. There'd be damage. <laughs> it would be bad. <laughs> it would be very bad. But we've both seen it. Yes. So, know. but what do you do? Terry, you fake your own death. That's what you do. I mean, it sounds like a good idea at this point in time. <laughs> I mean, right, yeah, what are you going to do? I don't have any suggestions <laughs> you know? for him. So like I'm like, eh. if he came to me and was like, what do you think I should do? Should I pick my own death? I'd probably be like, shh. Yeah, you know, maybe we're the try. <laughs> maybe we're the try. Roll the dice. <laughs> yeah. So on January 10th, Schranker travels to Harbersville, Alabama. Here he transports a red Yamaha motorcycle in the back of his pickup truck. The motorcycle had saddlebags that contained what I read was approximately $3,000 in cash, survival supplies, like camping supplies, knives, and MREs for food. He put the motorcycle in a storage facility and told the owner he would return to pick it up on next Monday. This was a Saturday. Okay. He did this. He then returned to Indiana as if nothing was going on. The next day, January 11th, Schrenker departed Anderson, Indiana, in his turboprop single-engine Piper Meridian plane. Must be uh, rough. <laughs> I know, right? He is scheduled to fly to Destin, Florida, mm -hmm. but while over Birmingham, Alabama, Schrenker makes a distress call. Mm. He tells air traffic controllers his windshield imploded and he's bleeding profusely. Now, I don't know if you know anything about windshields on airplanes. Yeah, wouldn't it eject you? They don't implode. Oh, I didn't even think about that. I was just thinking about, like, being up and wouldn't you, wouldn't it, like, wouldn't he just, like, fly out of the plane? Um, Maybe not. Maybe that's no, just, like, well, a commercial. Well, I mean, he does. I don't know. You've seen a little too much top I have. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but they don't implode. Windshields of airplanes no. don't, like, no. how, when have you, not even in movies. But anyways. So, Schrenker then set the plane to autopilot and parachutes out of the plane. Mm. Please don't tell me that plane, like, hits a house or something. Close, but no. So, military jets are put in flight to intercept the plane. It's oh, an yeah, yeah. Emergency. They come up to the plane. They see the plane flying with the cockpit door open. And no one in the plane. And the windshield is perfect. Yeah. Could you imagine, like, flying up and just seeing me and, like, like where'd he go? Yeah, right. What happened? <laughs> okay. I thought this was an emergency. Yeah, he did not bank on that. No, he no. did not bank on that. Um, so they follow the plane for almost 200 miles. And it crashes just north of Milton, Florida. Very close to a residential area. Oh, okay. He got lucky there. He that did. Been really, that could have really been bad. really bad. Investigators show up to the crash site, and they discover that the windshield is intact, and there's no blood in the cockpit. Everything, yeah, they, they don't understand. They also find some things inside the plane. Um, two things, a U.S. atlas and a national campground directory. Huh. Both are missing Florida and Alabama sections. No, he's not. We're hustling all this money. Yeah, I know. <laughs> not that not the brightest. No. no, he should have just. I got some you ideas, kind of, but you kind of feel bad, right? Because I'm like, oh. I just think it's funny, and I think that you know our military is probably like, I gotta see this windshield. We gotta figure out what happened to this plane. <laughs> I just have a picture like someone flying next door, like you're pulling up to someone on traffic, and and there's looking nobody over there, and just being like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, next day, January 12th, uh, Marcus Schringer turns up in Childersburg, Alabama. 
This is about 225 miles from where his plane actually crashed, where it went down. He shows up at a random house, wet from the knees down, and he tells these nice people who answered the door that he was in a canoe accident with his friends. Hmm. So they contact the police. I don't know if he planned for that. Okay. The police come because there was a canoe accident. No idea what's going on yet. They don't know that there's been a plane crash. They don't know that there's a missing person. So they take him to a hotel in Harpersville, Alabama. I'm sure he's wishing right now the police weren't involved. But by the time the police returned to the hotel, he had paid for his room in cash and fled into the woods. Hmm. Again, not exactly the brightest bulb. But I wonder if it's at this time he had seen the news and realized his plane didn't crash into the Gulf of Mexico as planned. Mm -hmm. So he put it on autopilot, planning for it to crash into the Gulf, thinking okay, there was going to be, that they would think the plane crashed in the Gulf and he was gone. Right. We just, okay. That would, that would, that would have been better. That was his plan. But I imagine him sitting in his hotel room, turning on the news news and and seeing there's a manhunt for him. Yeah. Because it was national news at this time. And he was like, oh, shit, I'm going to pay for this room and split. (laughs) (laughs) I just rack up my prison time. Uh, Yeah. So um, that same day, they issue a temporary restraining order that freezes all of his personal assets and all his assets of his company as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's in trouble. Yeah. That night... uh, I don't know what he was thinking, but he sends an email to one of his friends who's also like a neighbor telling him in the email that everything was a big under- misunderstanding. He's really sorry. He's sorry for everything he's done to his family and the trouble he's caused, but he will be gone by the time he reads this email. His friend was like, oh, hell no, and turns it over to law enforcement immediately. <laughs> <laughs> him because <laughs> I don't know <laughs> so there's like a massive manhunt for Marcus Schrenker they're looking all over for him and on January 13th his luck would eventually run out the storage facility where he kept his motorcycle reported that it was gone mm-hmm. and a judge in Indiana actually um, issues an order for his arrest for the financial fraud. They now have enough yeah. evidence. That night, he's arrested at a KOA campground in Quincy, Florida. Oh, we, why couldn't we get lucky enough to be, like, camping and, and like, see, see this whole thing? Down? Yeah. So they were able to get an idea of his location using the information from the email. Now, remember, I probably wouldn't have been privy to 2009. I wouldn't have thought of that either. But they got a, a kind of like a roundabout idea of where he was at. But he brought attention to himself when he missed the 5 p.m. checkout time at the campground. Oh, God. He didn't check out in time. Uh-huh. This is one of the campgrounds where, like, you can rent, like, the tent and everything, right? So he didn't check out in time. So the campground owners, because we all know the KOAs are, like, personally owned by these really great people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they go to check on him. And they notice a large red stain on the outside flap of his tent, which was super alarming. So the husband goes back and tells his wife. And then at the same time, the couple is contacted by the local sheriff asking if they would noticed anything in the area. Funny you say that. We oh. have this guy in a tent who didn't leave. Yeah, yeah. Before you know it, authorities are on the campground property. They find Marcus Shrinker inside the tent. He had cut his left wrist in an area near his elbow and was hardly conscious. He wasn't really able to speak. Most of his words were garbled, but he did mention die at least a few times as they were trying to treat him. Mm. Not on my watch, Marcus. Nope. (laughs) In the tent were knives, a laptop computer, toiletries, MREs, clothes, and maps. Not exactly what you pack when you're going to die. No. Unfortunate for him. Authorities did not waste any time. And on the same day, January 13th, Schrenker was charged with 11 counts of financial fraud and his bail was set at $4 million. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, not that he was getting out anyway. 
how many. No, but He's they were screwed. pissed. Yeah. You know how authorities get. Oh, you just yeah. put us on a man. We released yeah. the Coast Guard. Yeah. We flew next to your empty plane. Like, yeah. that's a big deal. That's a really Sorry, big deal. Sorry, buddy. You're in trouble. At this time, he also received a $12 million judgment against him for the sale of an airplane to a gentleman in Alabama. I couldn't find what the details were in on that, but apparently he hustled someone and it didn't work out. And... So, if he had all these planes, why in $12 million? Dude, sell the plane, get the $12 million, pay back what you owe, and just move on with your life. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was... He was in deep. I he, was he, in, was, he was going to do was, time no matter what, but... I think that probably the sale of this plane was probably... Part of that. Just <laughs> baby. Like, that was yeah. just like the tip of the iceberg compared to everything he was in on. In June 2019, um, he pled guilty to two federal charges... One for the intentional plane crash. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. And the other for the Coast Guard's unnecessary response. Kind of a big deal. He was sentenced to four years and three months in prison. He had to pay $34,000 to the Coast Guard for their response. That's how much it cost the Coast Guard to come out that day. And $871,000 to Harley Davidson for the plane that he crashed because they held the lien, it wasn't paid for. This was a different plane. The hitch just kept coming. Yes, not not good. No. Uh, he also had several other claims against him. He, it's just so much money. Um, these were totaling around twenty million dollars. My God, he owed money to. Everyone. Wow. That's why he wanted to die. Oh, well, yeah. pretend like he was dead anyways. He had no he had no intentions of dying. He loved mm-hmm. himself too much. He just wanted to pretend. <laughs> so funny. Just, I just love how you see things sometimes. <laughs> he did. No, no, yeah. He thought he was still smarter than everyone else. They usually do. And he would have kept hustling too if they would have let him. If he oh, didn't yeah. get caught, I'm getting all out. Um <laughs> By August 2010, most of his possessions were sold. Obviously, his family was displaced from their home, and they had a huge culture shock. It's really bad for them. Ultimately, he pled guilty to five counts of security fraud, was sentenced to 10 years in prison, and to pay back his victims approximately $630,000. And this is only the people he was being charged for. So this was not... All the other stuff that was still out there. This is just the people who had, like, that lawsuit against him. I feel bad for all the people. I they mean, lost their just... retirement. Their kids' oh, college savings. They lost just everything. Can't imagine. It's terrible. And in the end, he did, too. Yeah, no, he did. I mean, they they trusted him. They thought he was a friend, a <sighs> family. Like, they were family friends. That's just shame on you. Shame on him, for so sure. Horrible. His 10 years of imprisonment imprisonment was to be served consecutively with his prior um, sentencing from his plane crash. And he was also, at this time, very much divorced. (laughs) Oh, I bet. (laughs) She was not. She was not having that. Uh, He was released on parole September 25th, 2015. He did his time. And today, he is a free man. Uh, His parole ended September of 2019. Ooh, okay. So beware, people. Yeah, All I can find usually out, these people go back and oh, do you, exactly what they just did. You know it. All I could find on him today that he now resides near Pensacola, Florida, ironically, near where the plane crashed. Really? I don't know if people know, but that would give you something to talk about at the PTO meeting. It definitely would. A couple little interesting side notes. So while in prison, Shrunker, he meets a guy, Matthew Cox. Have you ever heard of him? No. So he's a con man. He serves. He served about 20 years uh, for bank fraud. And while this guy, Matthew Cox, while he's in prison, he decides that he's going to change his life. And he, he talks very openly about um, all of the things he was charged with. He was like, I 100% did all of it. Bad decisions, but... He's going to change his life, and he decides he's going to become a writer. And he starts writing for fellow inmates. He's going to tell their stories. Kind of cool. Yeah. If you think about it, right? 
So Schrenker approach, approaches Cox, and he wants Cox to tell his story because he feels he's been wronged. He didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. He still claims that because of the downfall of the market is the reason why they his clients lost their money. He, I mean, still telling this fellow inmate who mm-hmm. is also done bank fraud. You yeah. can see right through him. Oh, oh, yeah. He didn't do it. So Cox sits down. He interviews Shrinker. He gets all this information. And Cox tells his story, but in a different way. Oh, good for you, it's buddy. <laughs> so good. So the book is called Bailout, The Life and Lives of Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. So I read a large portion of it online. And the flip is, is that it doesn't make Shrinker into the victim that he wanted it to be. According to Cox, Shrinker is a pathological liar. Mm-hmm. And it took a con man to con him out of his story. Yeah. So, like, Cox is like, I'm a con man. And it took a con man to know a pathological lighter. I see through you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. it's, it's such, what I read was so good. And Shrinker's crazy. Yeah. The embellishments in his stories are so yeah. un. Believable. <laughs> well, he had all this time to lay there and oh my think gosh. about I can't even how, believe right? it. How to spin it. It just but I mean like they just I so he says, and this is just one of the pieces that when he parachuted, there's this he tells about when he parachuted from the plane, and it is so elaborate and his parachute shredded and this and that, and the parachute um apparatus cut his scrotal sac and he lost a testicle and he looked for it in the water i mean this story (laughs) is so off the hook you have to read it just for entertainment value i do no one will believe it but anyways cox he's still writing he has a website it's called inside true crime.com it's cool he's a cool guy i mean he he knows what he did wrong and he's He's trying to make it right. That is cool. It's a cool. You should check out his website. We'll put a link up. Um, another thing is, is that, you know, like I said, Trinker blamed everyone but himself for being in this situation. He said that after his wife found out about his affair, she took control of an offshore account and started bilking the clients and out of over $1.5 million. And that he took the fall for her. What? Come on. And he couldn't get the money back. And that she was actually named CFO on the business. Mm-hmm. But she says that was just on paper and she had no idea what the day-to-day was. Which I can kind of see too. I can see both ends of it. Because Steve would be like, I'm going to put your name on this. And I'd be like, all right. Like, I would too. I'd be like, all right, what do I sign? I'm what sure I, I was on Steve's business. I had no idea. I mean, we Probably. had that conversation before. I'm like, if he dies tomorrow, I don't know what happens to his business. Because I have no idea yeah. what goes on. But I know my name was on it. So I can see her point. At the same aspect, I have a hard time believing he was this smart to move around this much money and make that much money, but he couldn't jump out of a plane, right? Right. So maybe she did know more than what mm, she was saying. Right. I don't know. Investigations turns out. What they, did she do? They couldn't link I mean, her to anything. Like a stay-at-home mom, but she what? wanted to be on the Real Housewives. All right, but like what like was her real? No, she was actually. Oh. Trying, they she was trying to get the real housewives. Like I'm not kidding, that was their life. Okay. I don't know what her her degree was, in but college. you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, was she an accountant? I think she went to school for accounting. Yeah, I think that's how she was made CFO. As for his investors, their return was pennies on the dollar. Hmm. That's right. awful. Yeah. So they sold off his house, his cars, his stunt plane, all of his other lavish lifestyle items, and there still wasn't enough money. They seized his bank accounts, they auctioned his properties, and they end at the end they end up with five hundred and fifty six hundred thousand dollars in cash. That's not enough. Oh no. He owes three point nine million dollars to investors whose money he misappropriated. And another $9 million to creditors. Wow. He was. Wow. He I mean, was that's just. just charge yeah. it, charge it, charge it. Give me a line of credit. Wow. Uh, he has, he's made claims that, that uh, 
He has, there's more than $1 million in offshore bank accounts that his wife knows about. Yeah. Accountants are unable to prove this. And basically, law enforcement says the cost of tracing that money, if it exists, would outweigh any benefit. Mm-hmm. They can't find it. And it's not even worth their time. It's, at this point, it's sounds crazy. It's only $1 million. No, I mean, it doesn't sound crazy. I mean, it's, yeah, I get it. But I just, how do you even get an offshore account? I kind of just, I, I want to know. know. I just, can we get one? <laughs> if, how much do you have to put in it? I don't know. I just but it might be, like, be cool to say. We have our, I, what about our offshore account? I can't account? tell anyone about it. Yeah. Uh, like, do you have to be shady to get an offshore account? I feel like you do. I thought only, yeah. People who were, like, hiding drug money I, and, like, criminals the mob had offshore had, accounts. I thought only the mob had offshore accounts. That's what I thought. I, I don't know. It's. If you know anything about offshore accounts, <laughs> please write in because I have to know. Can we get one? We have I like should look oh, into wicked that. ones offshore. That's like the one thing I did not <laughs> look into when I, I look into everything on these. Right? Later on, all Jesus. of our merch money, offshore account. Offshore account. It's probably never coming back. We don't know where we send <laughs> it. We don't even know. It's in the cloud. What is it? <laughs> oh, gosh, not the cloud. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so basically, they said to, according to, I guess, the law. All of state and federal taxes would be paid first, okay. off the top, um, and that would only leave about two hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars to pay off all of his clients, mm-hmm. and that averages out to seven cents per dollar lost. <sighs> Just makes me want to throw up. That's awful. Um, I know. On another note. I spent all my time getting the Peacock app. <laughs> There's a show, American Greed, uh, Crash and Burn on season four. There's a special about him. Ah. Season four is no longer on there. You can't get anything prior to season nine. So yeah. If you find a way to see this, <laughs> tell me. I'm just curious. You know me. I like to mm-hmm. Read it, listen to it, watch it. Yeah, you like usually do. You do. All of those aspects. But so what do you think? Do you think his wife was in on it? Mm. <sighs> I don't feel like I know enough about her to know if she was in on it. But I feel like how can you turn a blind eye? To, how can you not know where some of this stuff is coming from? Right? Like, don't you have questions? Aren't you like a little bit? Like, I get like kind of being like, all right, your day to day. But... Yeah, plenty. I mean, can you, if she's a, truly as smart as we're, we're thinking maybe with the account degree and then being a CFO and, and all that. She might have just pl- turned the blind eye. She probably yeah. did because you can't tell me mm-hmm. she didn't understand the numbers that were coming in versus what was going on and what was going on. Yes, yes, yes I yes, have yes. a feeling she knew. I have a feeling she knew, but she was willing to ride it out and let him take the fall. Mm-hmm. Like, she might not have had her hands in it. Yeah. But she wasn't going to stop it. Yeah. No, I think she was going to keep getting those Gucci's. I'm telling you, yeah. (laughs) Well, so that was a mild story, right? Yeah, no, no, it was. There's no real death. I love it. Mine's mild, too. My next one is, too. I told you, I promised you no death. No no murder death. So. uh, All right, well. Everybody. But it's it's funny that you said that. I have to tell you, it was so funny. Because the other day, the kids were watching a show that they love, too, on TV. And at the very end of it, it said, it was Liv and Maddie, actually. So the kids are, like, really into that. At the very end, it said, like, the last day to watch this is April 22nd or something. It was, like, so dramatic. And Ava goes, wait, what? What did that say? She started crying. And I was just looking at her and chased her. She, he goes, <laughs> he goes, it's leaving Netflix, Ava, not the world. <laughs> I think I snort laughed, like. <laughs> so hard just the fact that my <laughs> my eight-year-old said that to our almost 12 year old and she's crying because of her show that's awesome it was hilarious i will but... tell you that we're watching supergirl for the second time and when manal had to leave the planet because yeah. of the lead in the air oh. i was sobbing oh <laughs> i knew i was like oh my gosh the alien has to leave <laughs> earth and he can never come back it's so sad <laughs> And I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh my gosh, you've watched. never watched Supergirl? Oh, no. it's so good. Well, we watched good. the finale of Liv and Maddie and I cried, so I can't yeah. really, I'd probably cry too. You know it's coming. <laughs> ah, I just mm-hmm. get so attached to my characters and my yeah. people. They're like, it's okay. It's okay. All right, well, we'll continue with, um, I don't know if we can call them lighthearted, but. 
I mean, so, kind of lighthearted. It just, but in, I mean, still crying. A different kind Nobody of Nobody dies, but like, it's still devastating to lose your life savings and oh. your, your retirement fund and all that. Like that just, oh, those people did not deserve that. That's just awful. I'm curious. I would really be curious to know what he's doing today because he can't tech. I mean, from what I understand, he no longer can ever hold a position in finance. Well, I would hope not. Like that's part of his. Yeah. Like you're barred, you know, like mm-hmm. a lawyer who does something wrong, like you're done. I don't know, maybe he like runs jet skis down at the beach in Pensacola or something. That would be kind of a fun job. Yeah, it would be. So, I don't know. We'll have to look it up one day and give back to everybody if we, if we do find out. All right. Until then, find us on Instagram. Yeah. The Wicked Ones Podcast. Everywhere. Oh, and we really will be on YouTube soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's coming like next week. Okay. <laughs> See you later. See ya.